Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and Kern High School District, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael and in studio with us, I have Stephanie. And Stephanie, if somebody needed to contact us, what would they need to do? For math homework help, call in Bakersfield, 661-636-4357. Everywhere else, six, I mean, wait, no, one, eight, six, 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 three, six, six, two, eight, four. The email for Do The Math is do the math at kern.org. We're online at do the math online net and on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done. There's a lot of sixes in our phone numbers, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah, there there's more lot. than there probably should be, but there's a lot of sixes in there. Yes. But that way somebody will remember, oh, yeah, I know there's a lot of sixes in the phone number, and that way they can get all of us. True. Anyway, Stephanie, where do you go to school and what grade are you in? Uh, I'm doing online school. So it's hosted at McAuliffe, but I used to go to Miller. I still go there to go to Gate, and I guess. Okay, I'm so just you're doing kind of both. Yeah. So you go to school at Miller, mm -hmm. and you go to Miller when you go to your Gate class. Yes. But you do your online class with McAuliffe. Yes. So you're like hitting three schools in a week. Mm -hmm. That must keep you pretty busy, huh? Yes. All right. So how do you like doing the online thing still right now? It's pretty good. Okay. There's really no homework and it's honestly pretty good. The teacher there is actually very good, is okay. very nice. Good. And then you said you go to Miller mm -hmm. to go to Gate. So do you like going to that? Like being able to be around some other students? Yeah. I get to communicate with other people that I used to know and like some I used to know, bef know before the pandemic. Right. So I get to interact with them. All right, good. So that is something good, and it's nice that you're able to handle both of those different types of education right now. Mm -hmm. So you're able to go and do things in person, and you're still able to do things online, and you like the way both things are working right now. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. So sixth grade, you'll be in junior high next year. Yeah. So is there anything you're looking forward to with junior high? Uh, I really don't know. Uh, I guess the experience because you get to go to many multiple classes, and I think that would be fun, Yeah. but yeah. more homework. That's the <laughs> Well, that's definitely going to happen, more homework, right? Because you're going to have probably five or six different teachers, mm -hmm. and they're going to all give you homework all the time, so it will be a little bit more work. But it will be fun, because you'll have different instructors, you'll be in different classes with different students. you make a whole lot more new friends also. Yeah. And with all of those new experiences, you will grow as a person as well. True. All right. Well. You know what, we're going to get you busy doing some math homework in a little bit because I see you're working on some equations. But before we do any of that, let's first take a look at today's Math in the News. All right, so today's Math in the News, we're taking a look at Eastern Europe. And we can see the map up there. And you can see some of the countries are labeled with letters. And one of the countries that's big in the news is Ukraine. And there are some surrounding countries there. And off chance, I mean, I'm, I'm putting you on a spot right here. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea which of those countries that is labeled with one of the letters? Mm -hmm. Which one do you think is Ukraine? I think it's uh, K. Which one? K. K. Close. It's a little south of that. So D is where Ukraine is. 
and they're in the news, but the reason we're bringing this up is because to take a look at a map, all right? Now, the next map we're going to look at, what country is this? Uh, the United States. That's the United States, right? And it says, how few colors does it take? And the United States right now, it's just all of the states are white. Uh, They're yeah. not even colored in. True. But if you wanted to color them in, and you don't want one state, like let's say you make one state blue, mm -hmm. okay? And you don't want the next state, okay, so here we are, California right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, let's say this is blue. This state of Oregon, we don't want blue because it would be touching, it's bordering it, and you wouldn't be able to really tell where one ended and the other started. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so we might make this blue and this is green. Mm -hmm. Okay, could we make Washington blue? Mm, I guess so. We could, because it's not touching California at all, mm -hmm. right? But if we make this blue and this is green, can this one be blue or green? I guess it would have to be a different color. Right, it would have to be a different color, right? So we're on to a third color now. So taking a look at all of these states, how many different colors do you think it would take so that no two are touching of the same color? It says how few colors does it take? I was yeah. originally going to say like 48. Well, that's a lot because that, you don't need that many, right? Yeah, but I guess you would need like about six. Okay, so about six. That's a good estimate, mm -hmm. right? Because you think, all right, uh, you know, if I do one here, one here, right? There's two. This one's obviously it's got to be different, right? Yeah. That's got to be different, mm -hmm. right? Because it touches these two. So that's where we're going to go today, all right? So there were people trying to figure out the number of colors it takes to color a map with the fewest number of colors. And that's a math problem. Do you know how long it took people to figure that out? Uh, I'd say like a lot, more than a year, yeah, but uh, less than 10 years. 120 years. What? Yeah, it took people <laughs> 120 years to figure out that problem. So there was a guy trying to color in the counties in Britain. Mm. All right, he had a map of the counties in Britain and he was coloring them in. And he wanted to see, you know, how many colors will it take to do this? He thought it could be done with four colors. He told his brother, okay, and his brother was a math student. So he goes, hey brother, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to figure out how many colors I'm going to need to color this map. I think it's four. So his brother told his instructor, now remember he's a math student, so he told his math instructor about this problem. Mm -hmm. The math instructor then told all the other people that he knew involved in mathematics and they all started working on this problem, seeing how they could prove this and it took them 120 years to finally be able to prove it. Wow. Yeah, so let's take a look at the next slide here. So here's an example of what we were talking about, right? You see how we have sort of a pinkish purple and blue? Yeah. So you can't have, so this works because you can tell where each state is, correct? Correct. But this would get a little confusing, mm -hmm. right? So the four color theorem is what he came up with. So it states that no more than four colors are required to color the regions of the map so that no two adjacent regions have the same color. Regions that meet only at a corner may be the same color. It was the first major theorem to be proved using a computer in 1976. And that was a bit controversial at the time because people had said, well, it was proved using a computer. All right. But if we look at this, these aren't countries, but they could be shaped like different areas, let's say. Yeah. And how many different colors do we see there? Uh, four, four, only four. All right, red, blue, yellow, and green. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that shows the four color theorem being applied. All right, so here is a map of the United States, and how many different colors do we have? Only four. We have only four, right? We have the blue, green, yellow, and red. Mm -hmm. And do you see any places where two colors of the same are touching? Mm, not really. No, there aren't any, right? Because they all, right? This, a famous spot in the United States, four corners, right, where these four states meet, right? So we've got all four mm -hmm. of those states' different colors, right? And everything surrounding them 
is a different color as well. All right? So that is the math and the news for the day, the four color theorem and how that is applied. So we're going to do a little something with that in a couple of moments. But first, let me remind everybody that we do have phone tutors available until 530 most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. We do have a phone caller waiting. But first, we have an opportunity to go out and about. We'll check in with Mick at Quinn. Back out here for day two out at Quinn Caterpillar. Back with Craig Henderson, parts manager here at Quinn Caterpillar. And last time we were here, we saw the service bay, we saw the front dealer side of it where people come in and order parts and talk to you guys about sales. We saw the service bay, we saw the massive D11 um, and just how insane it is, how big of machinery you guys service. And I know you mentioned last time the machines don't wear out, but their parts do. Yes. And you mentioned something about the tracks. I'm looking here. I don't think these tracks are nearly as large as the ones no, we saw last time. No, they are not. But, I mean, is this an example of, you know, tracks can be pulled off and put on? And, and what are the different parts that have to be replaced on these? This is. This is a great representation. So you can see here, again, um, using the analogy of a bicycle chain, you can see the chain portion underneath. And then this is a shoe. So this is a portion that goes in the dirt. And this comes off. So maybe on this one, it looks worn. So we might replace the shoe, but the track is okay, or vice versa. The, okay. the point is that it can be disassembled, put back together like new, depending on the application, because sometimes these need to be higher, what have you. The pins can be replaced, turned, and then be put back together and back on the machine so it can do what it's supposed to do. So I take it there's a special machine or someone who does this specifically only works on tracks or this application, is that yes. right? Yes, yeah. And we'll have the opportunity to see the track press, go in the fabrication shop and see how they do that. It's, um, it's loud, it's very <laughs> loud, but it's, it's really neat how they, they're able to take this and again, rebuild it so it can go back on a machine and be back in the dirt. Well, perfect, let's go inside and check it out. Great. Awesome. Yeah, so in here we will do fabrication, we'll do welding, um, and then also the track presses in here as well. So we talked about how we take the track apart, um, either put new pins or shoes and things like that. The track press, the machine that's, that, that does that work is in this facility as well. Okay, so I mean, when you say a track press, I mean, I think of someone running on a track. So we're talking about the track that goes on the bulldozer that allows it to travel on the earth. Correct. Um, yes. So when you take that apart, I mean, do you have to take the whole thing apart? Can you take off one piece at a time? Or when you guys do it, is it more efficient to just redo the entire track? Most of the time they will do the, the entire thing. There, there could be applications maybe where it's just uh, pieces or parts, but most of the time it's, it's going to be, since they have it off, they're going to do the majority of it. What, what do you need to do if, if a shoe is maybe too short or something else like the shank on the D11 that goes into the earth eight feet down? And eventually that thing's got to have some wear and tear. You guys, you know, you mentioned having being able to service it. What do you do to service it? So they, they put a product called tungsten on it, and we have a, a, a tungsten bench. We have a couple of machines that actually put that material on the metal to make it last longer. Um, also, they, they may need to do some welding. They may need to change the diameter or change the, the pieces or parts themselves. But for the most part, they're going to add material to it so that material will wear rather than the part. Awesome, and you also mentioned some welding. You know, I think when people think of welding, they think of the oil field, but they also don't realize that you weld metal together. I mean, is yes. that usually, is that stronger sometimes than just a nut and a bolt? Um, or do you use them in tandem? Um, how, how does that play into this? It, it can be that the machine's actually broken. So sometimes because of the, the environment that they're in, the tractor or the machine will break and they'll weld it. Sometimes they'll add um, gussets or things to the machine to make it stronger. There might be an update to make it stronger. 
And then sometimes it's just to fabricate, like we saw on the D11, that engine was larger. It did not fit in, the, in that machine, so they had to fabricate the hood for it. That's okay. done here as well. So that was all done in here. If you have to yes. build something from scratch that's never been done before, this is the place for it. Yes. So where, where does everything come from to, to make all this? If it's not fabricated, I'm sure it has to come from somewhere. So when we come back, I'll send you guys in the studio. But when we come back, we'll try to find out where do these parts get stored. And so until then, back to you guys in the studio. All right, thanks for that, Mick. And also a big thanks to everybody at Aquin. We had a wonderful time when we were out there, learning quite a bit about what goes on in that factory as well and all of the repairs that are happening. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30. Right now, we'll go to the phones. Nathan, how are you this afternoon? Good, and yourself? I'm wonderful, thank you. As soon as you're ready, let's hear the math problem that you're working on. We'll go ahead and start putting some stuff on the board. Uh, okay. Um, there, are, there are equal numbers of pennies, nickels, and dimes and quarters in the piggy bank. Two coins are pulled out one at a time, and each coin is replaced before the next is drawn. What is the probability that the sum of the values of the two coins will be less than 15 cents? Accept your answer as a common factor, a fraction. Okay, so Stephanie, put less than 15 cents over on your okay, side of the board. So That's what we're looking for. So, wait, so. Just write less than 15 cents. Okay. You just write it out. Less than 15 cents. All right, <laughs> and you said you need to have this as a simple fraction, correct, Nathan? Yes. All right, so you have an equal number of pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. Mm -hmm. And how many are being pulled out at a time? Uh, two. Okay, so let's first of all take a look at the different combinations we could have, all right? Mm -hmm. And when you pull one out, you're putting it back in before you pull the second one out, correct? Yeah. All right, so if we start with a penny mm -hmm. and we put it back, could we get another penny out? Um... Yes. Okay, so we two have two pennies. Now, if I pull a penny out, could I then put it back and could I get a nickel? Yeah. Okay, so that's our next option. So let's just do the pennies first, all right? So if I pull the penny out, I could get a penny, a nickel, and what else? Penny, nickel, um, a dime. Right, I could get a dime, and if I put everything back, I could start with a penny and then get what else? My um, nickel. Well, we already did the nickel. A dime? We did the dime. Uh, that's it. Okay, we could do a quarter, right? This is, uh, these no, are just can't. the possibilities without worrying oh, about yeah. the 15 cents yet. Yeah. Okay, so we've done everything that starts with a penny. Mm -hmm. All right, so now let's start with things that begin with the nickel. Okay. All right, if I pull a nickel out and I put it back in, what else could I possibly pull out? Uh, a dime. Okay. And if I started with a nickel, what else could I possibly pull out? A penny. Okay. And if I pull a nickel out again, what else could I possibly pull out? Uh, another nickel. I could, right? Because if I put it back in, I could pull it out a second time, right? Uh -huh. And for the last one here, if I pull out a nickel, what's the last thing I could possibly come up with? A quarter. The quarter, all right? Do you see a pattern starting to form here? Yeah. Okay. So let's do the dimes. All right. So I pull a dime out. If I put it back mm -hmm. in, what could I possibly pull out again? A penny. I could do that. If I start with a dime, what else could there be? A nickel. Good. I pull a dime out, put it back. What could come out again? Another dime. Another dime I could pull out. If I pull out a dime and put it back, what else could come out? A quarter. A quarter. All right, so Stephanie, you're going to write down the next combination. Okay. All right. So, Nathan, we started with pennies, then nickels, then dimes. What are we going to start with now? Quarters. Quarters. All right, so I pull a quarter out, I put it back. What else could I pull out? A penny. Good. So I start with a quarter again, put it back. A dime. Good. The next one? Um, a nickel. Good. And the last one. Another quarter. Good. So these are all the possible combinations we could pull out if we take one coin out, replace it, and then pull another coin out. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. All right. So we need to have a fraction as an answer. So mm -hmm. what, what does a fraction mean, first of all? 
from a number out of another number. Right. Like, for example, like one, like two out of one. Well, yeah, two out of one, one would be a fraction, but it would come out to be a whole number. Let's say we had two out of five, mm -hmm. right? So if we had two out of five, mm -hmm. the total is on the bottom, and the number part that we want is on top, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's a fractional part. We don't have the whole thing, right? So we want to know how many of these are going to be less than 15 cents. Now, first of all, let's figure out how many there are. Okay. So between you and Stephanie, figure out how many different combinations there are. Okay. So Stephanie, you figure out how many combinations there are. Nathan, you figure out how many combinations there are, and we'll see if you guys agree. Okay. So. Okay. So as soon as you have an idea, Nathan, let me know. Um, I got 16. You got 16. You got 12? Mm -hmm. All right, so show me where you got 12. Okay, so look. Here are all the combinations that we did. So adding them all together, it would be 12. Okay, so we've got four here, right? Oh, wait, shoot, no, it's 16. There you go, all right. So you may have just been looking at these ones. Yeah, I, think, I believe right? I said Okay, I so there are 16 total possibilities. You agree with that? Yeah. All right, so draw a fraction line over there, Stephanie, and put mm -hmm. 16 at the bottom. That's how many possibilities we have. Nathan, what do we want to know? Um, what com how many combinations can result in 15 and lower? Okay, so, Stephanie, I'm going to start over here. Mm -hmm. Is a penny and a penny less than 15 cents? Yes, it is. All right, so I'm just going to put a little star next to that. What about a penny and a nickel? Mm, it is. It is. What about a penny and a dime? It's 15 cents. Well, so a penny and a dime would be... Wait. 11 cents, yeah. right? So that's less. What about a penny and a quarter? That would be 26 cents. That's too much, isn't it? Yeah. So it that's is. gone. Nathan, let's take the next column. A nickel and a dime, what would that equal up to? Nickel and a dime, 15. Does that work? Um, no, or yes. Yeah. So read the question again one more time. What do you have to find? Oh. There are equal numbers of pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters in the piggy bank. Two coins are pulled out one at a time, and each coin is replaced by the next before the next is drawn. What what is the probability that the sum of the values of the two coins will be less than fifteen? Okay, so the key word is less. Mm -hmm. So will a nickel and a dime work? No. No. So that's gone. What about a nickel and a penny? Yes. All right. What about a nickel and a nickel? Yeah. Okay. What about a nickel and a quarter? No. No. All right. Stephanie, what about a dime and a penny? A dime and a penny, I guess that would work. Since that would, would work, be 11 right? Because that would be 11 cents. What about a dime and a nickel? Uh, that wouldn't work. It's not going to work. That's 15 cents exactly. Mm -hmm. Dime and a dime? That'd be 20 cents. Doesn't work. What about a dime and a quarter? That wouldn't work. That wouldn't work. Nathan, let me ask you about the last column we have there with quarter, penny, quarter, dime, quarter, nickel, quarter, quarter. What can you tell no, me right would, now about no, those? All of them would not. Yeah, none of them are going to work, right? Why? Because the quarter is already 25 cents. And it doesn't matter what we put with it. We know that none of those are going to work, are they? Yeah. So we need to now see how many of these did work out of the original 16. So let's take a look. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. So, Stephanie, let's go six over 16. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that, Nathan, that there are 16 possible answers? Yeah, I okay. do agree with that. All right, now, you have a fraction, which is what they wanted. Do you see anything that you could do with that to make your answer uh, more complete, let's say? No, I do not, because it cannot be simplified. Okay, what do you think, Stephanie? Uh, I believe we could put 6 out of 16 is the answer. Okay. Do you think that that can be simplified? Is there anything we can do to that to simplify it? Mm, yes. Uh, you yes. think so? Mm -hmm. Nathan, what do you think? Um, we could divide both by 2. Okay, so Stephanie, divide each of those by 2. Okay, so that would be 3 and that would be 6. 
Almost. 16 divided by 2 is? Uh, wait, 8. There you go. All right, so Nathan, what about 3 eighths? Can we simplify that at all? No. No. All right, so 3 eighths, so go ahead and circle that one right there. That will be your final answer. Did that help you out, Nathan? Yes, it did. All right, good. Thanks for the phone call and for your phone call this afternoon. You've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at the Broken Yell Cafe, so nicely done. All right. Well, young lady, you've uh, been here for almost half an hour. You had not do a math problem yet, have you? I guess I have. <laughs> you ready to work? Uh, sure. All right, here we go. So let's take a look at your homework. This is what you brought in. Mm -hmm. And do you feel pretty comfortable doing equations? Uh, it's complicated because the negatives. Okay, so some of the negative stuff is throwing you a little, little bit. Yes. Right? All right, so let's go ahead and write this first problem up. And we'll go ahead and work on it together. Okay. All right, so let me just write it out quickly. That's bothering you, isn't it? Yes. Okay. All right. So, how would you like to start? I guess we could start with the three. And what do you want to do with it? That would be three plus three x. Okay. So before we go on, how did you determine that that's three plus three x? Okay. So the three is next to the parentheses without any like signs like multiplication, division, addition. Right, but when yeah. we see it next to it, it means to multiply, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's what you did. So you went three times one, and then you went three times positive x, which is how you got that. Yeah. All right, so what do you want to do next? Now we need to put the equal sign. Okay. Now, there, I believe we're not able to work with the two, so let's just write the two again. Good. And then now we have the brackets, so three. Right, so, so what I'll do is I'll open up the brackets for you, and okay. we'll do everything inside the brackets first. Okay. All right, so go ahead and explain to me what you'd like to do. Okay, so it's the same thing with this one. So it would be 3x plus 6. Good. Now, this is the part you said you kind of, you probably know what to do, but sometimes it throws you a little off, yeah. right? So there's no number outside of this set of parentheses. Yeah. So what is implied to be there all the time. One. A one. So go ahead and put a one up there. Good. So it's actually negative one times everything inside of it. Oh, okay. Does that make sense now? Yeah. And that does throw a lot of students off because they don't see a number, so they just put negative x plus one. But we know now that you can't do that. Yeah. Right? Because it is negative one outside of the parentheses. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and continue. So then it would be negative x plus negative 1. Okay. And do we need, so you like putting the plus negative 1 in there? Yeah. Okay, that'll be fine. So let's go back over here. I'll do this side of the equation. Okay. All right. Can I combine 3 and 3x? Three uh, no. No. All right. I'm through with my side. Now what okay. do you need to do? I guess I'm able to combine a negative x. Well, hold on there, sister. Before you start combining things, mm -hmm. don't we have to do oh, our... Oh, right. This. There you go. So this would be 6x right. plus 12 Good. minus 2x Good. plus negative 2. Perfect. All right, so you've gotten rid of all your parentheses and brackets. Yeah. That's the first thing you needed to do. The next thing is to combine like terms. I'm going to combine my like terms, but I don't have any, so mine's still going to stay the same. Do you have like terms to combine? Yes. Okay. I have 6x and negative 2x. All right. so, so I'm just going to underline those so that the students at home can see what you're putting together. Okay, so that would be 4x. Good. Then I have positive 12x and negative 2x. All right, so you're going to put together positive 12. And negative 2. Good. So when you put those together, what do you end up with? 10. Negative or positive? Uh, negative. No, positive. Are you positive? Mm-hmm. How are you so positive? Because when you, because when you add negatives and positives, it turns out positive, I believe. Well, it could Wait, no, sometimes negative, be negative. negative, right? Yeah. Which number is larger? Mm, 12. And it's positive. Yeah. This is just like 12 minus 2. Mm -hmm. It's just 10. 
Okay, so positive 10 is correct. Wait, there's an addition sign. Right. Good, positive 10. Okay. So now you've combined everything. What is the next step? We need to move the numbers around. Okay. So do you want to move the x's first or do you want to move the numbers first? The x's. You want to move the x's? Yeah. Okay. So for So we usually get rid of the smaller x. Okay. So what is the smaller x? 3. Okay. So how will we get rid of that? Minus 3. Good. Okay. So that will cancel that out. Mm -hmm. Now if we get rid of 3x here, what else do we need to do? We need to add 3x here. Well, you're going to do the same thing you did. All right. Subtract 3x. Mm -hmm. All right. So now that you've done that on both sides to make everything equal and balanced, right? Because you have to do the inverse operation to make it cancel out. Mm -hmm. What do we end up with? I'll well, help you. I'll put the equal sign. Okay. So this is going to be x Good. plus 10. All right. And this would be a 3. Good, because the 3x and negative 3x cancel out. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, because we're still trying to find out what x is, what do we do now? Now we need to move the 10. Oh. Okay, so how do we move the 10? Uh, I guess we can move the 10 by doing negative 10. Right, so you always do the opposite, the inverse operation. Mm -hmm. And then here, negative 10. Perfect. Draw your line. Mm -hmm. Yep, all the way across. Mm -hmm. I'll help you out. Okay. What do we get? So that would be a set, negative 7. Perfect. And this would be nothing. X. Right. So did we find the answer for X? Yes. And what is X? Negative 7. There you go. So X is equal to negative 7. And what we'll do is we'll have you check that in a little bit. But for your excellent work so far today, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Chick-fil-A. So congratulations on that. Nice. All right. Have you ever been there? Oh, uh, yes. All right, good. Well, you're going to go again. You know what? We do have another opportunity. We're going to go to uh, visit Mick once again at Quinn. We're in a massive warehouse, Craig. Um, I see a lot of stuff around us. We talked about different machines needing different parts. How do you even, I, I can't even imagine the logistics that go into this. I mean, so after, I mean, you're the parts manager. You make sure we get the parts. Who's responsible here? Uh, for making sure these parts get out in a timely manner and go where they're supposed to go. Well, this is Jonathan. Jonathan is our warehouse supervisor. Jonathan facilitates the warehouse inbound and outbound freight. So, Jonathan, you know, Craig orders the parts, make sure they come in, um, it, but then you get them. I mean, what's your role in the warehouse here? Other, as a supervisor, what are you making sure happens um, for the service side and for the customer side? Just making sure we're, you're servicing the customer and doing it efficiently. So. Okay, so when someone comes to you, you know, and they're like, hey, we need a part, Craig. And Craig says, all right, Jonathan, do we have the part? You know, how do you guys find parts in here without seeing the actual part? Using our DBS system. So we can get on the system, check the part number, look up location, come out to the location and find the part. Okay, so once you find that part, how does it make its way to a customer? So they'll place the order, and the order kicks out. We have our warehouse guys pull the order, um, making sure that they're picking the right quantity, the right uh, part number and filling that order. Perfect. Now I'm also noticing we have some massive boxes to the right of us here on the other side of the warehouse, but it looks like we get a lot smaller. Is that set up for a certain reason um, that you guys set up the warehouse with larger items on one side and smaller on the other? Is that a logistics uh, efficiency for you guys? Yes, definitely. So you want to make sure that you're putting your smaller items that's going to be able to be quickly picked and your heavier items that are going to need forklift or anything like that in the back uh, because it's going to take a little more time. A lot of times, bigger items are not going to be ordered as much as smaller items that, you know, break or seals or anything like that. So you want to put all your fast moving product to the front of the warehouse. So you guys are just picking more orders, um, being more efficient. Okay. Now, Craig, let's say, for example, someone orders in some tracks and, and you guys don't have them, but, uh, but someone else may, may have them. Do you go to Jonathan then and have, have him kind of coordinate that retrieval process? Yes. Yeah, so we have a lot of different shipping methods that we use. We have, it could be a big rig, it could be um, a car sometimes, it could be a truck. So depending on the size of the part. And then we have a shuttle system throughout our dealership network that we use to get parts from one store to the other. So as Jonathan stated, that order is generated through our dealer business system. That order is processed depending on the size and or destination 
Jonathan and his team will ensure that that either gets to the customer on site, delivered, or gets to another branch in our dealer network. Okay, so it sounds like there's a lot of math involved also here. I mean, we, we've noticed there's a lot of math in all the aspects here at Clean Caterpillar, but I'm looking around and there's the hundreds of thousands of parts you guys have in here. Um, how does math play into what you guys do to make sure customers are receiving efficient products? You know, you want to make sure first, from a manager standpoint or a supervisor standpoint, efficiencies, right? You want to make sure that we're picking as many orders that we can in a certain amount of time, and you know, that's all math. Um, also, is if we did inventory, if we're looking at a part or a pallet of boxes, and we're saying, hey, how many filters we have here? Well, you know, you don't want to go and grab a machine, take the pallet down, count each Sit part. Sit there and pull each one off yeah, and then put them all back, back on, on again. There. Okay. You're, you're doing the math. Okay, well, three boxes across, four boxes deep, two rows. All right. We got, you know, 24 boxes. So. Okay, so it sounds like, you know, I teach sixth grade every day, and so my students might ask, well, how do I use volume? What's that for? And it sounds like here's the application. You know, someone wants to know how many are on this product, uh, how many are on this pallet, they can use a volume formula, length times width times height. Yep. Yeah. So math is used, whether students realize it or not, every day in the workforce somewhere, um, whether it's from welding something, measuring the pressure of something, or even how many parts do we have? Do we need to order more? Do we have enough? And, it sounds like you guys have a well-oiled machine here. For lack of a better term, you guys are phenomenal at what you do. Thank you so much for your time. Jonathan, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Great, Craig, thanks for bringing Thank us you. in here. Hopefully, when we come back to you guys, we'll be able to show you some of the other parts that might be used. So some of these parts are ordered and ready to go as soon as they're ordered and needed for a machine. But sometimes, some things have to be made, like in the fabrication shop, and some of those things might be hydraulic hoses. And you said, Every machine is almost hydraulically driven, is that right? So especially the bigger ones? Yes. So it sounds like pressures portion. and hoses are very important. So when we come back, we'll show you guys where are those made and just how important they are. Send it back to you guys. All right, thanks for that, Mick. Hey, reminder, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30, most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. We are celebrating our 20th season on Do The Math this year. Stephanie is helping us celebrate. She's mm -hmm. our guest today a student from Miller and McAuliffe because yes. you're doing in-person and online at the same time, yes. getting the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. And you're enjoying both of them, correct? Yes. All right. Well, let's get back to work because you've got more homework to do. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll go ahead and put the problem up on the board and then we'll go ahead and work on it together. Okay. All right. So we have three times the quantity 3x plus 1. Oh, there's that negative again that you love so much x minus 1 equals 6, and then x plus 10. All right, so okay. how do you want to start this? I guess I'm going to start on this side. <laughs> you want to start on that side? <laughs> yes. All right. So it's going to be 6x plus 60. All right. So you thought you were being pretty uh, sneaky there. You taking that side, huh? Yes. So that means I have to do this side? Yes. All right. I'll do this side as long as you tell me what to write. Okay. How about that? Fine. So 9x. All right. Plus. Wait. Uh, 3. Got it. 8. Plus 10. Then minus. Wait. Negative x. Neg minus negative 1. So wait. if I have a minus a negative 1, what will all of that turn into? So. An addition sign. There we go. So let's back up a little bit. So first we had 3 times 3x, which is what you got 9x, mm -hmm. right? And then we did 3 times positive 1 was positive 3. Yeah. And what's out here again? Uh, negative 1. So go ahead and put your 1 up there again so that that way you remember. Okay. So then we had negative 1 times x is mm -hmm. negative 1x, yes. right? And we can put a 1 there if we want, but you just wanted to leave it at negative x, which yeah. is fine. So now what's next? Now what's next is an addition sign. Why? Because a negative plus a negative equals a positive. Right, a negative times a negative is a positive one. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. All right, so let's put our equal sign down. Mm -hmm. What about that sign? Anything we have to do? Uh, yes, we're going to actually no, nothing. All right, so just go ahead and rewrite it. Good. Can I do anything on this side? Uh, yes, you can. What will I do? You need to add the 9x and the x. And that would be 8x. Very good. <laughs> now what? So positive 3 plus positive 1 equals 4. So plus 4. All right. So we're getting it down, mm -hmm. right? So we've got 8x plus 4 is equal to 6x plus 60. 
-hmm. Now what do we need to do? Now we need to um, move the axes and all that. All right, so let's get rid of the smaller x, all right? Because then mm -hmm. we don't have to deal with negative x's. Yes. So which is the smaller x? This one. How do we get rid of it? Goodbye. So we're going to subtract that, right, do the mm -hmm. opposite, and we're going to subtract it on this side also. All right. Mm -hmm. So now what is left? I guess what is left is a 2x plus 4. Good. Now, now what do you want to do? We need to remove this. We 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 need to remove one of the numbers. Okay. We need to remove one of them because we have two of them. Yes. What are we solving for? Mm, x. We're solving for x. So we want to leave the x's alone since we have them all on one yes. side now. Now we need the numbers all on one side. Good. This is where the x's shall be. So four, you've been eliminated. Good. So you do the opposite. Mm -hmm equals nothing, and this, wait, no, equals here. Good. 56. Very good. What about over here? What do we have? An equal sign and 2x. Good. Okay, so now we have 2x is equal to 56. Mm -hmm. All right. So now what do we need to do? Now we need to divide 56 by 2. Why by 2? Because that's how much 2 is here. We need to only have 1x, or known as x. Right. And whatever's in front of the x, that's what we divide by because that's the opposite of multiplying. Yeah. Right? So we're going to divide this by 2. Which would equal x. Very good. Equals 56 equals. So you're going to go 56 divided by 2. Do you want to work it off on the side? Yeah. All right. Wait, no, it's Why did you stop so quick there? Not 24. 8. 28. You sure about that? Two times. You're correct. You're correct. Yeah. I just wanted to see if you were sure because first you put 24 and then changed it real quick. Yeah. All right. So X is equal to? 28. Very good. All right. Nicely done. So mm -hmm. you feel a little better about doing those equations? Yeah. All right. Good. Well, you know what? We have an opportunity to celebrate our 20th season this year. And one of our partners has been with us for many, many years is ROC and CTEC. These videos that we've been viewing all year long have been self-produced by the students at ROC and CTEC. And today we're going to learn a little bit more about construction. The program's designed to take the students through uh, most phases of residential construction. Um, this year we've incorporated uh, underground plumbing, uh, foundation, concrete work. Uh, but uh, as you would see in the shop, we have uh, framing, um, rough electrical, rough plumbing, uh, finished electrical, drywall, uh, finished plumbing. Uh, so our, our main project that uh, we're getting ready to begin on next week is the uh, tiny house program, which we will build a, a tiny house, a full house on a, on a trailer. The reason why I wanted to choose this program was because I want to be an architect when I'm older, and this would give me hands-on learning on the, base, the basics of being an architect. I really like to build things at home, and I wanted to gain more experience so I can build bigger and better things. We're using math all the time. We're using volume to determine how much concrete we got to use. The foundation work that we're doing out at the farm, uh, if you guys come out, uh, we're having to use Pythagorean's Theorem. Um, we try to avoid using the term Pythagorean's Theorem uh, because uh, it, it kind of turns the mind off. Uh, what we call it is 3, 4, 5. Uh, in construction, you have to find right angles. Most homes are built with right angles. Uh, tape measures, you gotta know fractions. Uh, you gotta be able to add, subtract fractions. Um, all the cutting that we do of the wood, the measurements, they need to be within an eighth of an inch uh, for finished carpentry. The favorite thing I've learned so far is the framing. Um, it has a lot of attributes to it and it takes a lot of math and I like math. What I've learned so far is probably building walls, like putting them together and then the favorite thing would be like getting to know everybody in the classroom, like setting, like having new friends, getting to know the teacher better. 
The favorite thing that I learned so far was uh, learning how to drive a forklift. It's a lot of fun, um, especially with a ton of friends. Um, I really like building cabinets and just finished carpentry stuff. My favorite thing is like carpentry, like woodworking, like putting things together and like taking it apart. And I just like it because like it's, it's fun and enjoyable. A few of the certificates are the forklift certification, OSHA certification, SB2, uh, and the benefits are obviously that you get experience in construction trades, which gives you a huge advantage over other people applying in these fields. This year we've introduced uh, two new pieces of equipment, a uh, skid steer and a mini excavator, so they'll be certified on those as well. Um, my main thing is trying to get them in the mindset of, especially my seniors, uh, knowing what's out there, knowing what to expect so that they have an advantage when they go to try to get a job. I want them to be as prepared as they can possibly be um, so that when they go to a job interview, uh, they stand out and they stand above the rest of the candidates and they can get to work right away. Now we're out on the farm uh, working on foundation stuff, so digging trenches for plumbing and learning how to pour cement for foundation. They weren't using it, so I asked if we could use it because we can't really do our underground plumbing or our concrete work over there. So we came out here and cleared off all the dirt. And so now we're starting to do uh, underground concrete work out here. And once again, a big thanks to all the staff and students at ROC and CTEC. Great partners with Do The Math, and we are celebrating our 20th year and certainly do appreciate all of the work that those students are putting in this year, simply making our 20th season the best ever. And a lot of it is because of those videos that we're able to bring to you each and every week. In studio, we have Stephanie, a sixth grade student from Miller and McAuliffe, being able to enjoy both online and in-person learning. All mm -hmm. right. We're going to go ahead and take a look at some scenarios and we're going to see which one is lying or not telling the truth all the way. All right. So let's take a look at the first one. So Sam, so I wrote Sam up here. The guard said 1,200 people came through the museum today. So I'm going to write down 1,200. He said one-fourth noticed the problem right away. So one-fourth. And he said if 300 visitors could see it, then how could the curator not have known, all right? So 300. So, Stephanie, let's take a look at this right now. We know there were 1,200 people. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to see if one quarter of the 1,200 is equal to 300. Mm -hmm. So how do you think we're going <laughs> to figure this out? Division. OK. So what would you like to do? So we'll just kind of talk our way through this a little I bit. I guess we're going to have to divide 12, 1,200 by 4. Right. Okay, so if we do 1,200 mm -hmm. divided by 4, now, there's an easy way to do this. Mm -hmm. Since there are two zeros, we can just put them up there. So now, what do we actually only have to do? 12 divided by 4. And what is that? 3. 3. All right. So, is he telling the truth that 1,200 people and a quarter of them are 300? I guess so. He is, right? So that one checks. All right, so why don't you erase lying. that and we'll figure out what the next card is here. All right, here we go. So now we've got a Jed. All right, so let's take a look at it. Did you say one twelfth? All right, so that's our first number, one twelfth. Of the 3,600 exhibits, if there were 300 swaps made, all right, so we're just looking to see, will all of this work? All right, so he's saying that the total number is 3,600. Mm -hmm. And one-twelfth of it is 300. I believe that's correct. You believe it's correct? Mm -hmm. OK, 
Can you prove it's correct? I know how to prove it. So 36 divided by 12 is 3. And we know that we have our two zeros that match mm -hmm. up, right? So that's going to work like that, right? Yes. So this problem is going to work, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so far, that one checks as well. Yes. All right. Let's take a look at the next problem. Betsy. All right. The woman at the door said two-thirds. So why don't you go ahead and write two-thirds up there. Okay. Of the 1,200 visitors, so 1,200 would be our next one, came by bus. I bet those 800 people, so 800. So we need to see if 2 thirds of 1,200 is 800. How are we going to do this one? I guess we're going to have to divide again. This time by 3, and it would be 4. Okay. So with the knowledge of that, each one of them would were going to be divided by four, I believe. So, so because you're taking one third of twelve hundred would mm -hmm. be four hundred. Mm -hmm. But we want two thirds. Which would be eight hundred. Which would be right. So eight hundred is correct, yeah. right? Because one third of twelve hundred is four hundred. Yeah. But since we want two thirds of them, that will be eight hundred. Okay. Right. So that one checks. Go ahead and put a check mark there. Neat. All right, let's take a look at the last one. Alice. All right, so okay. go ahead and put Alice up at the top. Someone said one eighth, so we have an eighth, mm -hmm. of the 3,200, 3,200 pieces of pottery were taken. Where would I put the 800 pieces of pottery? So we want to know if one eighth of thirty two hundred is eight hundred. Mm. I'm not. I'm not sure. Well, let's go the mm -hmm. way you did it before, right? We have our thirty two hundred mm -hmm. divided by what? Mm, eight. Eight. We can already put our zeros up. Mm -hmm. So what's thirty two divided by eight? I have no clue. <laughs> sure you do. Let's count by eights. Sure. Eight. Eight times two. Eight times two is sixteen. 8 times 3? 24. 8 times 4? Uh, 34, 6, not 32. There you go. So it's 4. Mm -hmm. Right? So does 400 and 800 match? No. No. So who is not telling the truth here? Alice. Alice is not telling the truth, right? So out of those four situations, we have to find the one that is false or the mm -hmm. one that is not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Nicely done, all of these working with fractions. Mm -hmm. You feel pretty good about that? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know what? We do have one more opportunity to head back out to Quinn and visit with Mickey. I see a lot of hoses here. Um, where are we at now here in Queen Caterpillar? So today we're in the hose press shop. Um, we have Anthony with us. Anthony is one of our hose press operators. And what we do here is we custom make hydraulic hoses. So we saw the, the machines out in the shop that are hydraulically driven or maybe have pieces of the machine that are driven hydraulically. Those hoses fail and Anthony gets to rebuild them, uh, measure them, put new ends on them, press them so they can go back on the tractor, back on the machine so it can do what it's designed to do. Okay, so it looks like Anthony's working on a hose here. Now these hoses, I mean, they look like they have to be pretty specific, especially for the machines and how massive and how powerful they are. Um, how precise, um, if we can come over here and talk to Anthony while he's working, how precise do we have to get here at Clint Caterpillar when you guys are remaking or refitting or, or restructuring these hoses? Uh, pretty precise. They have to be pretty, uh, they have to be clocked right. I mean, that's a... a when you say ticket. clocked, what does that mean? Um, set in the angle of the hose. We always start with one that's straight up and then normally the other the opposite end will have an angle it could be uh, 180 to 90 to 182 so we usually get the uh, the degree out of there as soon as I put it on my on my vise here and uh, I'll get it figured out the, the angle and then uh, we've got a 
Same way we took it apart, we're gonna put it back together. Same so way. when students are sitting in class or watching this at home and they think, oh, I don't need to use angles or degrees, it sounds like this, this yeah. is pretty important for these massive machines and the power that they have. Yeah. And, it's, and it's critical, like Anthony is saying, if he doesn't have the degree of the turn of this hose correct, it will not fit on the machine. And, and sometimes the repair is done out in the field and so that means a technician, whoever's doing the repair, will have to come back. So Anthony will use a protractor to make sure that the degrees are set, um, that the, the lay line of the hose, the bend of the hose, all that's taken into consideration when he builds it. So previously when we were here the other day, and we saw that military vehicle and all the brand new hoses, those were all specced and, and made up in here? Yes, Anthony built all those hoses. Wow, so even something as, as necessary and as strong and as, as powerful as something for the military is made right in here the exact specifications and, and you're the man. And, and really a, a big machine like that, um, that that's designed to do a lot of work, a small hose like Anthony is working on right now will stop that machine dead in its tracks. And then we also talked about um, when we saw the D11, um, you said it's all hydraulically powered for the most part. Most of these, there's no crankshaft, there's no torque converter, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of, um, I guess you would think of physical parts, like an actual metal, um, pipe that moves, it's all hydraulic fluid, you were saying. Yes, yeah, it's all hydraulically driven. And, and that's why, again, the hoses, the hose portion, because there's gonna be a pump that pumps the hydraulic fluid, that has to, that hydraulic fluid has to get to its component somehow. Could be a metal pipe, could be something like this, or it could be a rubber hose like this that Anthony's working on. Most of the time, it's gonna be a combination of the two. You'll have some type of junction block where a metal tube goes to a, a rubber style hose. Okay, so Anthony, what would you say is the most mathematical part of what you do? I feel like everything in here has a lot of math into it. What would you say is the most um, common math that you do on a daily basis? If a student was wondering, this looks like a cool job, how do I get into it? What kind of math do they need to be successful with? Well, I just, uh, well, we do a lot of converting where we do, uh, for example, like uh, in, you know, centimeters into inches, stuff like that. Um, uh, I mean, that's kind of mainly probably what, probably the big one. Yeah, yeah, that's probably okay. The so one, if a manufacturer yeah. says we need two hundred and twelve point five four centimeters of yeah. hose, and you're thinking, well, I don't really measure that. We here yeah. in the United States, we don't necessarily measure everything in, in metric. Yeah. Um, so you have to do the conversion and make sure it's still down to that exact specification. Yeah, yeah it could be like a. It could be like 153.5 centimeters, you know. So you gotta gotta make sure that it's spot on. You can't really. Sometimes you can't really uh, add an inch to the hose or something because of the fact that the way it's routed, you know. There's a lot of times there's no space for that, you know, for that extra. You know, Different wiggle room. Like, like yeah, that. exactly. Wow, yeah. It's it's amazing to be able to see all this, and people don't realize that all these machines are operated mostly by hoses and channels, and oh, yeah. they have to fit a certain way. So Anthony, thank you so much yeah. for having us in here. No problem. Craig, thanks again so much for having us no, out here at Queen Caterpillar. It's been phenomenal. Next time we come out here to Queen Caterpillar, hopefully we get to see how does someone get started in a job like this? How do you get into the industry? And uh, what are some different opportunities that await someone who's maybe looking forward to this in the future? So Craig and Anthony, thank you guys so much for having us. Back to you guys in the studio. All right, thanks for that, Mick. Also, thanks to Craig and thanks to Mike Ford and everybody for getting this set up. And we will certainly hear more from Quinn in the months to come. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30. Stephanie has been a guest in studio with us today, a sixth grader from Miller and McAuliffe. And did you learn a little something today? Uh, yes, I Good. learned how to be better at negative numbers. <laughs> there you go, right? So negatives can be a problem, but not anymore. Did you have fun today? Yes, I did. Excellent. That's what we wanted to hear. Until we meet again, continue to do the math. Support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. <laughs>